that's not useful. If you, for instance, to understand number one, you have to understand an expression that involves that many symbols. Uh, so perhaps um, we have all this implemented, but we don't want to look at the code, right? So Matthias actually calculated that number one for Bubakin required four trillion, trillion symbols. That's a lot. So per perhaps uh, we, when we're striving for precision, we have to be careful not to have too much of it, more than what we need. And another thing we might ask ourselves is whether uh, we need that amount of rigor, perhaps too much rigor distracting. For instance, um, Principia Mathematica, uh, at some moment in page 379, the second volume, they managed to prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Uh, and it's obvious from this, right? You can read it there. So perhaps this rigor that they attained was not that useful in daily practice. And if you ask mathematicians, actually, they will be looking for beauty in, when they're talking about proofs. And this is a beautiful quote by Jacobi. It's a declaration of love for de Hichelet. He's the only guy that actually did it right, not Gauss, not Cauchy. These guys made mistakes. So um, when we start doing something that we would call structured proofs in the manner of, in the analogy with structured programming, do they deliver what we're expecting? Do, uh, do they deliver the beauty without uh, leaving correctness aside? Now, the, uh, some criticisms have been, have been voiced. Uh, Leslie Lamport, for one, is one that has been used in, he has been using in his papers for a long time, a style of writing that contains structure when he's doing proofs. It's like his proofs could be compiled. And he, him, uh, in a paper, um, he comments on, on criticisms that have been raised. Uh, and he gives an example, an interesting example. That's uh, the famous uh, general topology book by, by Kelly. Uh, there is this nice uh, proof of schroeder bernstein theorem in a very few lines. And he said, well, I'll try to formalize this in the 70s. And he tried to formalize this in the way that I would call it a structured uh, proof. And then he found a mistake. Uh, years later, he, he knew that he, that he had found that mistake. He tried to find it again, and he could only find it again when he started structuring the proof again. So the prose in the proof was easy, could easily uh, disguise the mistake. And then uh, he says, well, perhaps they, they, they might look too complicated when you put this structure inside. And they might not be uh, um, explanatory. If, if they might not be the right prose, 19th century prose that you want to read, but they might help you finding the mistakes, spotting the mistakes. Now, uh, another, another issue that we might, we might discuss is uh, actually uh, proofs uh, perhaps should be surveyable by us somehow, or else uh, we have this guarantee and we cannot check it. So uh, will this help us finding mistakes if we actually can read through them? We can actually understand the structure by, as human beings. Or else in the future, the only mathematicians will be the computers themselves and talking to, them, to, to, to each other. Now, if we do demand this requirement of uh, surveyability, we have to think of what we make of papers like this. Like this paper by Almgren, uh, having 1,728 pages. How much can we claim that it's surveyable? Uh, is, how many people have read it? Uh, the announcement of Gorenstein's about the monster classification that they, they had been finished, and then they found a, a little gap in the proof. And this little gap was actually filled by a 1,221-page proof. Uh, so how much can we be sure that this is all actually correct at this moment? So, so human surveyability seems to be a challenge as well. Now, the other thing uh, that I push forward is that, okay, if we're working on this analogy with software engineering, perhaps we should look for something that we might call proof engineering. I won't go very much into this, but we can discuss this later if there is time. Now, if I, I want to introduce this idea that computers can and are already assisting in doing math, and I will give lots of examples of things which are good illustrations, I think, of uh, the phenomenon. But I like, to, I like to, to start with this quote by Turing. It's, it's, he was not working for Google, but uh, <laughs> this famous, famous paper, famous preprint, actually, that he wrote in 1948, uh, says, well, you know, intelligence is about search. Uh, because you're searching for proof. You're searching for answers to questions of, uh, that have answers like decidability questions, yes or no. 
And he made some nice analogies in between all the kinds of search and the search that actually would characterize intelligence. And artificial intelligence, of course, um, was born more or less at that time from that work of theory. I don't know how much it survived from that idea, but it's, um, that was the initial thing. So let me define what I, what I will mean by computer-assisted proofs. It will be any mathematical proof that has at least been partially generated by a computer that can be done in several different ways. Could be computer checkable or computer generated. I'm interested in generated at the moment, but I'll also talk about, about checkability. And um, there are several ways in which a computer might be useful in exploring mathematical phenomena, verifying correctness, searching a database, discovering theorems or helping us discover them, uh, assisting in doing something formally in such a way that it could be verified or it could be called verified. And there will be, of course, risks involved, and this is the so sociological part of the enterprise. We have to, to worry about this. But the risks are already involved in informal proofs by human mathematicians. They make mistakes, and they have gaps in reasoning, faulty reasoning. Definitions are not always good. There are some things that they fail to take into account, special cases, and so on. So uh, there's a very nice book on this, on the sociology of mathematics, of, 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 proof, uh, of proof assistance by Donald McKenzie. I do recommend to each one of you who are interested. But nowadays, if you do ask people out there whether you should trust more computers of humans, I don't know what's your answer, but most people will trust more computers. So this is a phenomenon that we have to take into account, especially if there are a lot of calculations involved, because we do know that all of us make lots of mistakes in calculations. Okay, so um, these, uh, what, what would be proof engineering in that case? Well, you know, uh, software engineers, they have to, to deal with these large amounts of data, big data nowadays. They have to work modularly. They have, they have a lot of tricks of the trade, and perhaps some of them can be appropriated by, by mathematicians uh, using cross-references to avoid unnecessary repetition. So this is, uh, allows us to think about other kinds of data structures into which we could organize our proofs. Now, uh, I give you, I'll give you some examples. So the last of the talk will be about examples on how a computer has been used. For instance, in ex exhaustive checking, first thing that comes to mind when people think, well, it's just too much work. Let's ask for help for some assistant to do this work. Uh, for instance, you can, th you can think of uh, games that have been solved by using computers. Connect 4, for instance, it was discovered with a computer and proved by a computer that if you use optimal strategies, there is a winning strategy for the first player. So, uh, and uh, the Rubik's Cube, since this, the, the, the beginning of the 80s, has been investigated in, in looking for what's so-called the God's number, the minimal amount of, of moves to solve any, any, uh, any scenario in, in the Rubik's Cube. And they actually, in 1981, the, the number was 52, and the final number was reached in, nine, in 2010, which is 20. God's number is 20. So... Um, and more serious things, like folk color theorem, which I will be talking about. Uh, we'll also be talking about generation of models, generation of proofs, and uh, formal verification. And uh, at the end, if there is time, some the decided decision procedures. We've seen something about this last time also. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, I, I didn't mention it here because I don't want to mention a specific software. I met Stephen Fulfring last week in Rio. It was really interesting. Um, he was, has this small stand making advertising of Mathematica as if he needed it. But at Mitchell Feigenbaum, which I did mention some slides ago, he worked on uni universalities were actually investigated using Mathematica. It was my first introduction actually to the, to the topic when I was on my undergraduate years. Um, but that's, that's a way of doing it, and it's abstract algebra assisted by mathematics. Uh, but this is also internalizing some other things that we'll be talking about here, like Koch, Isabel Hall, and so on. But we'll be talking more about proof assistance, which is not the case of that, those uh, systems, which are widely used, obviously. But I'll be talking more about computer-assisted proofs, so mathematics could be made into this. And I will be mentioning one case in which it actually was used in um, the proof generation case but mostly it, it will be more helpful for other tasks, for organizing and working on the, on the, on the code. Now, uh, one thing to call attention to, which is important, is that when you talk about the formal correctness in, in this sense, using a computer assistant, uh, there will be some axiomatic framework behind this. That means there will also be a, a, um, an implementation that needs to be, to be checked, and this is, has been thoroughly done in the last uh, years, one checking the other and so on. So we can, we can actually trust, that if the matter was trust, a lot 
these things nowadays. But of course, it will always be an issue, uh, uh, and it's something to, to uh, int be interested on. But one thing that uh, we might think as, 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 as um, um, a hint to the future, perhaps all this move is going to also to define a new role for referees. What will be uh, a referee doing in the time when uh, computer-assisted proof will be the norm more than the exception? Perhaps uh, the role for the referee would be to assess a paper by using his professional judgment and check whether it could be formalized or it could be run or it could be transformed into a formal proof. So this could be more and more in the, in the heads of uh, mathematicians in the future, having to uh, deal with the, with the possibility of, of, um, of checking whether the, what's defined in, in the proofs of the mathematician actually could be, could be formalized, uh, uh, could be transformed into a fully formal version in the sense of being computerized. Now let me start with the examples then, if you don't have any questions. I would like to, I think the examples will, will try to will illustrate better than anything that I said before, how the computers can actually be used. This, this example is, is one, uh, of course, very important because we all worry about Paraguay going into war with uh, Brazil and, and Argentina again. Uh, in, in Europe, it's Luxembourg, which never went to war, I, I think. But uh, the, the, you all know the problem, the problem of coloring a map in such a way that the neighbors will not share colors. It, there is a dual problem, which is the problem about graphs, about the, uh, if you transform this, it's a topological problem, right? If you transform this into dots and then you connect them through edges and you have to guarantee that the vertices do not have the same, the same color. And uh, the theorem says that you don't need to use more than four colors if you have, you're talking about a planar graph. Now, this actually was proposed by, by this guy, Francis Guthrie, who was the brother of a guy who you know, you all know, Augustus de Morgan. Uh, he proposed it to the professor of the Morgan, and the professor couldn't solve it, got very embarrassed. He couldn't prove that four colors were, were enough in 19th century. Actually, this demanded a lot, a lot more time, and uh, the first, actually, uh, proof that was offered was in the end of 19th century. It was wrong, but it, it was published in a very important uh, journal and stayed for 11 years without anyone pointing out the mistake. But the strategy behind the proof actually survived as an induction on reduction of math configurations and actually was used uh, in the 20th century to produce the, the actual proof, which uh, appeared in 1976. And that proof used the computer essentially for calculations, for exhaustive checking of situations. Of course, there's an infinite number of maps, but the idea was that using some symmetries, using mathematics, you could reduce this to a certain uh, number of configurations, and at the end you would have only 1,936 minimal such maps to consider. Those that if you could uh, uh, prove that you, you could color them with four colors, then you would finish proving the theorem. There's a lot of, a lot of checking to be done. And the, the, uh, the reduction was actually uh, done by, uh, proved by absurdity. You would, you would assume that they needed five colors and then show that you could reduce them, which was the same idea here. So it's an induction on uh, 1936 uh, induction steps. Uh, of course, no one wants to do this by hand, and the computer was used for this in the 70s. Nowadays, anyone can do this at home, but at the time, it took a long time, many hours, and um, at, the, at, at the end, three years later, Apple and Haken uh, won the Fulkerson Prize, or the first uh, Fulkerson Prize um, it, it, given by the AMS. At the same year, the SCARP won the prize for this paper on, on classification of NP-complete problems. Now, yes. By hand at the time. Right. At the time, yes. They, that, that's the part that could have mistakes. So that's the only part that was checked of the proof at the time. Because the other one, they would offer the, 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 the program and say, just run it. Okay? So that was the part that was checked. And that was why uh, many mathematic mathematicians didn't like the proof at the time. Because they said, they said I, we want to check also the other part. But no one actually wants to do it by hand. So we need it to be checked, but we don't want to do it. But that part on, on, the, on the reduction to these um, minimal maps was done by hand. But uh, this was improved later on. For instance, uh, in 1996, we knew that only 633 configurations needed to be checked. And this was actually reached by mathematics again, by looking at the symmetries and improving on the configurations they had before and eliminating some of them by hand. So there was some, some, some improvement on this. Now, 
The uh, final word on this actually came by Gontier, uh, working for Microsoft in France. He, uh, first of all, he defined what he meant by a formal program proof and, and said, well, it's something that must tell you not only what to do, but why you're doing it. And the what to do is the algorithm, but the why you're doing it would be the, the, the way of, your way of checking that you're actually going towards the solution. So it would be the contain, the proof would contain the formal proof of its correctness. But the, uh, it was practically by hand, and uh, it was a one man's task. He had no team behind him, basically, when he used Koch to, uh, to do the, the whole proof. So not only the, the part that Apple and Haken had done before, but the whole part, including mathematics, was, was uh, formalized in Koch. So this was a, completely, uh, uh, a complete formal proof uh, produced by him in 2005. Um, Okay, so later on, he would have other people working with him. For instance, uh, when he proved, uh, you mentioned the Fight Thompson um, theorem, that was 2012. He had a big team working for him, and um, that, that's a much larger theorem in, in size. But uh, I don't mention it here because it's not very more informative than this one. And it's, it's, there's nothing there that I, that I had um, particularly uh, wanted to call attention to. And here there's something that I call attention to, which is that one part of the theorem involves, uh, involves exhaust exhaustive checking. That's a part that the computer, people think first about the computer to do. But I give another, another example which is completely different. It doesn't involve exhaustive checking at all. But it might, as you will see. So that's the only picture that Tarski looks serious that I could actually find. Uh, so was a party man. And uh, people would visit him, and he would give them a problem. I will get to the problem in a moment. But just let, me, let us remember what we learned in school about addition and multiplication. Uh, these are the rules that we memorize in school. And the things that we use to reduce one, uh, one um, side to the other and try to check whether an equation is correct. So uh, the idea is we have these axioms, equations, identities, and we work on them uh, when we're working on natural numbers. But we can ask ourselves whether these could be used as the axioms of a complete, obviously sound, but complete full set of axioms for the, the theory of the natural numbers without zero, with uh, plus and multiplication, with addition and multiplication. And uh, the answer is yes, this, you don't need more than this. Everything that you can do, uh, you can do with this. And the way you show this is that you, um, actually, you, you can even prove there is a decision procedure which is based on the idea that you reduce each side of the identity into a normal form, which is a polynomial, and you compare it, so it should reduce to the same polynomial. It's a terminating procedure. So, um, Dedekind, in the 19th century, he's, he was worried in a larger part of, of arithmetic. So there was exponentiation also. So th these 11 uh, equations were the, the, the ones that Tarski called the high school identities, and he would give them to people and ask them, can you solve the problem of this, of showing that this is complete, that this is decidable? But just go, before we go into this, let me just look at how a computer scientist uh, look into this. He might think of this as a data structure, in which you have something that plays the role of a zero. I'm adding zero here to make it easier. You have a successor, addition, uh, multiplication, and exponential. You define recursively these things, and you prove the identities by structural induction on these equations. But that's a way of implementing the operations, right? So, and I have actually enlarged a little bit by including zero so that we have the base case which is more sensitive. But the, um, the question that we have here is a different one. It's a, from the mathemat mathematician's point of view, we want to answer the same questions we had before. So now I have a structure which contains also the exponential and it, I want to ask myself this very natural question if this is a complete set of identities or axioms for that structure for the equational theory of, those, of the natural numbers and whether there is a decision procedure. What do you think? Is this, uh, is this complete? Who thinks it's complete? Uh, is there any axiom missing here? Before, I have claimed that there was not, that this was a complete axiomatization of addition and multiplication. Now I just added exponentiation. I'm asking whether this tells you everything you need. It's, it's all that I have learned in school. So if, if it's not complete, they have lied to me in school, right? They didn't teach me everything. And is there a decision procedure? Before there was a decision procedure, is there one now? Well, the answer is, is that it's not complete. And, but there is a decision procedure, so not, all is not lost yet. The decision procedure actually turns into 
translating into the posit positive uh, part of the real numbers and using uh, the tools of analysis. But uh, it's, it's not efficient, but there is a decision procedure. But I will talk more about the, uh, about the no part of the question. So Tarski asked people to solve something which actually had no solution. He didn't know that at the time. Now we do. And the way we do it is actually that has, we have been able to present in the 80s, much later, actually an identity, which is true, but unprovable, from those axioms. Okay, so that's one, that you could, uh, just abbreviating A, B, C, D, these polynomials here, you can actually prove that these two things are equal, and one way you can do that is by factorizing. You factorize C and D as being A and B times this new polynomial here. And that, it, doesn't, it, it becomes much easier if you, if you want to do the calculation to prove that the two sides are equal by doing this normal form reduction. But why, why is it that then that this is not done inside the theory, inside the, 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 using the axioms I presented before? Well, somehow we could say that the trouble of the theory we had before is that it cannot handle this, cannot handle this negative coefficient. So we can do it, but the theory cannot, because the theory has no subtraction. So um, what else do we know about this? Well, actually, we uh, logicians in the, in the audience will like this, perhaps, that the first that this identity is not derivable was actually a proof theoretical argument, it was an argument saying that there is no derivation, an induction on all derivations that you can produce from the axioms we had before, and so that none of them ends with this. So, now, no one wants to read it, right? But it's a logician's proof. Uh, people like, that's what I'm talking about there, that's model theoretical arguments. So there were, these are the ones that people actually uh, uh, like more, actual counterexamples, so find me the, the guys who are the counterexamples, who will, uh, will, will, um, will be such that you have an algebra that satisfies all the identities you had before, but does not satisfy this equality. So the first solution was presented by Gudevich with 59 elements algebra. Why is it a lot? Well, because if you have a two-element case, you already had 4,096 different tables to test, which only five candidates at the end. But if you have five elements in the algebra, you have 10 to 52 tables to test. And this guy found an example with 59 elements. Obviously, it was not with a computer. But he used this, the, 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 the symmetries he needed to accommodate the identities inside and still get an, a counterexample in the same tables. This was much, much improved later on using computers. And uh, Burris and Yates, they showed that actually uh, there are counterexamples with, uh, counterexample with 12 elements. And this guy published a paper in uh, each car showing that there is no counterexample with, uh, with, um, with less than, than, than 11. So actually, we don't know, actually, if there is a counterexample with 11 so far. We know there is one with 12, but we don't know the, 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 the least counterexample. And as I said, the, the counterexamples with five already would need, for exhaustive checking, would need to, to look for 10 to the 52 tables. So it's impossible to check all of them. You have to use some mathematics to assist you and to eliminate by symmetry some, some uh, non-counterexamples. But these uh, two uh, uh, developments here were done uh, uh, with the assistance of, of computers intensively. And that's worth uh, showing, and this is about generating models. Now, just to answer the last question uh, about the, uh, you having been uh, uh, lied to by your teachers, there was a good reason for it. It's not that they didn't teach you this because this was what was missing. There is an infinite number of things missing. There's no way of finitely axiomatizing that, that equational theory uh, with the exponential. So that was also proved by Gudevich in 1990. Just out of curiosity, it's interesting to, to mention. At least I, I felt relieved. They didn't lie to me. They lied to me with a good reason. Okay, so uh, I talk about this later if there is time. What connection with lambda calculus. Anyway, I want to show another example, different way. So now, before we were, we were uh, uh, generating models, I want to talk about generating proofs. Can computers find the proofs by themselves and generate proofs? Now, this is Robbins, who was a, a contemporary of, of, of Tarsi. He, there is also a prize with this name, given by the AMS, Robbins Prize. And um, I tell you the story. The story is, also involves a, 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 an exercise given by Tarski to everyone that would visit him. But the idea is the following. Everybody knows what a Boolean algebra is. 
And uh, the problem is that can you actually recognize it if, you, if you're, it's given to you using different axioms, different identities? For instance, there is, uh, in 1933, Huntington proposed an axiomatization in which he just took the, the joint to be commutative and associative, so two equations, and added one identity. And you say, well, it's, there's a, the meat is missing. You just define it using the Morgan rules. So um, this identity, if added to commutative and associativity of, of join, actually produces a, a, an alternative axiomatization of Boolean algebras. But then Robbins came and said, I can do it better. Why is it better? Because I use less symbols. Here you had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight symbols. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But did he prove it? No, he didn't. He said he could do it, he didn't prove it, he never even published this. He just gave it to the community in, the in 1933. And the problem was actually out there for many, many years. So let me just uh, recall what's going on. So this might not be Boolean algebras, so let's call it Robbins algebras. Robbins algebras are algebras in which you have these two things which are commutative, and, oh, you have the joint which, which is commutative and associative, and you have this extra axiom. Now the question is whether you can prove they're Boolean. So you can prove all the axioms of a Boolean algebra out of only these three axioms here. So people were improving this on the mathematical side, saying that, well, if you can prove certain things, then you actually can guarantee. For instance, uh, this work of Winker is, was very important on this. He said, well, if you can find, for instance, two guys such that the uh, complement of their union or, or of their join is equal to the, the, the complement of the first one, then you can prove that this is a, a Boolean algebra. So these were interesting because some, idea, some people uh, had the idea, okay, so let's give this problem to an automatic prover. Let's try to prove it by contradiction. Let's assume, for instance, that the second Winker uh, condition is wrong, so that this is false, and let's try to arrive to a contradiction out of this assumption. And that's what they did. So William McCune, who was uh, um, working at Argonne National Laboratory in the US, he uh, developed some programs to do this. And some of these programs are actually very famous nowadays. Author didn't survive, but it actually is uh, inside uh, Mace and Prover 9 nowadays. Actually, Prover 9 was mentioned yesterday. And um, they actually managed to guide the computer into looking for the proofs which would be interesting. And after some work, the computer was able to, to output the proof by itself without anyone having to, to, to say, do this and that. He just tried and tried and tried and found out a proof which was uh, the final solution to the problem. Robbins algebras are Boolean algebras. Obviously, Boolean algebras are Robbins algebras because this is respected by any Boolean algebra. So these are, this is an equivalent axiomatization for Boolean algebras. So this was based on proof generation, which is different from, from the proof theoretical argument I talked about before and, about, and different from model generation that I talked about before. Now, computers were heavily used in this proof. First of all, as I said, finding the proof. And that was a, a novel thing. In 1997, there was no interesting mathematical conjecture that had actually been proved solely with a, with a computer looking for the proof. And nowadays there are more, but the, at, at that time it was, uh, was interesting. It, it's, it's, it's just a, a benchmark, right? It's, uh, and it's used for, for, for many proofs even nowadays. You, you have a new proof assistant, you can give him this problem. Can you prove it? Because there is, I did it in 1997. If yours can't do it, then it's not very good. Now, computers were using other things, for instance, in parsing the proof, because it's very complicated, the structure of the, uh, of the um, terms that appear in the proof, lots of parentheses. We make a lot of mistakes in reading these kind of things. So even parsing the proof was uh, uh, made with a computer, and the mathematica was used here, in parsing the proof and in refining the proof. Uh, so refining meant that after you had parsed, you could see, well, there are some short tracks. So I could just go through here and perhaps they can make another proof which is smaller than the previous one or with, uh, that it uses the structure in such a way that you can, can actually uh, um, make it shorter. And in, finally, in checking the proof, checking that every step was following the rules. And that's the thing that uh, um, formalized mathematics has been used the most, actually, in, in checking proofs. Uh, so far, at least. But the, the important thing I call attention to here is that this was a proof that was found with a computer. Another example, different thing, not proof generation, not model generation, not exhaust, exhaustive checking, formal verification. So actually, it is about, uh, like Gontier did, writing a full formal uh, program, um, program that would uh, represent a mathematical proof. So um, 
many of you know this problem about packing spheres. So you have to put these spheres inside uh, a box or inside any, any space. And what's the best way of, of, uh, uh, of using the space you have inside with, of packing this? Would it be like people do in the market or would it be in some other way? Um, and um, the conjecture, of course, is that people in the market know what they're doing. But you have to prove it. And Kepler had this problem, uh, proposed this problem uh, hundreds of, of, of years ago to one of his uh, patrons who was paying for his, his work. But the problem had already appeared uh, a little bit before, actually, in, uh, when people were worrying about piling cannonballs. What was the best way? So uh, Sir Walter Raleigh, he had a mathematician as an assistant and asked him to uh, solve the problem. So he made a conjecture and he couldn't prove it. So some instances of the problem were solved later on. So the problem is from the 17th century, beginning. And Gauss in the 19th century was, uh, got the solution for regular lattices, so for some uh, very specific configurations. And this guy um, might be known by some computer scientists here working on rewrite systems. Uh, he um, proved for the, the two-dimensional analog much easier, but it was only proved at the end of the 19th century, so it's about packing circles. Uh, and uh, the problem was important enough to be in the list of Hubert at the beginning of the 20th century. Now, this Hungarian mathematician uh, had a solution in his mind. He knew how to do it, but he couldn't. He, he didn't have a computer at the time. He said, I need more power to compute my solution. And uh, people are not happy exploring that, and some people are trying to find uh, an analytical proof. For instance, this guy in, uh, working in the US, um, he published some proofs which people found to be incomplete, but he was convinced of them at some moment. And finally, Tom Hales, uh, with his uh, PhD student Samuel Ferguson, produced the proof with computational flavor. Let me just enter into a little bit detail on this proof, just for you to, to uh, see how it goes, uh, the history of it. So in the beginning of the 90s, the, the important journal Annals of Mathematics said he would start to accept computer proofs, and 98 invited Hales to submit the proof. He just claimed to have produced of, of the Kepler uh, conjecture. And at that time, the proof involved the 300 pages of mathematical argument plus a lot of code. And they couldn't check if this was correct. Both parts of the proof were difficult. So they just made a panel of experts, which was led by the son of that mathematician that I mentioned before in Princeton. And four years later, they failed, right? They just said they're 99% certain. That's failure in mathematics. Oh, no, but they talked to each other for four years. They had the first conference, and they had some meetings after that. Uh, and after four years, they said, there's no point meeting again. We're just spending too much money on this, coming back to Princeton. And uh, the uh, editor of Annals of Mathematics was very disappointed, of course. He said, OK, so we, from now on, probably will not, no longer start to accept uh, this, this kind of proofs. And they said, just send us the. Um, uh, a, a short version of the mathematical kernel of the paper, and we're going to publish it, 2004. And the computational part was published later on in the journal Discrete and Computational Geometry. Uh, Ian Stewart had a nice comparison of this proof to uh, Andrew Weil's Fermat's uh, last uh, theorem. He said that, that the Weil's proof of Fermat's last theorem uh, resembles war and peace, while Hale's proof of Kepler resembles a telephone directory. OK. Um, anyway, what comes after this? Well, Annals decided no longer to try to fully verify correctness. He says, I, we trust the computer to do this. We're not going to, do, uh, to test and run math code. Hales got a position in Pitt. He was in Michigan. Uh, won the Robbins Prize, so the guy that I mentioned before. Later on, uh, together with Ferguson, they won the Ferguson, Ferguson Prize. Por ejemplo, un grupo te va a dar lugar a una de estos, pero sí hay otros espacios también de este tipo que no vienen de grupos. Por ejemplo, un teorema ya un poco viejito de Solomon. Solomon estaba trabajando en la clasificación de grupos finitos simples y quería probar que no había ningún grupo simple que tuviera el mismo docilo que este otro grupo y en el que todos los elementos de orden 2 son G conjugados. En fin, un elemento, una, 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 cosa, una cosa que se quería probar en teoría de grupos, porque si hubiera existido algo así, me habría dado un nuevo grupo finito simple, al final se probó que no, no había. 
Pero resulta que cuando uno mira la demostración de Solomon, él empieza a mirar, bueno, ¿cuáles serían las posibles conjugaciones que podría haber ahí? Y no le da ninguna con contradicción. Al menos cuando mira los subgrupos cuyo orden son una potencia de dos. Pero luego, cuando empieza a considerar las conjugaciones entre subgrupos que eh, sus órdenes son potencias de tres, a ella sí le da la contradicción. Entonces resultó que la contradicción no estaba en el primo 2, sino que estaba en poner los primos juntos. Y en el primo 2 de por sí, ahí no, sí había un objeto que estaba bien definido, y es lo que se dieron cuenta Levi y Oliver, y en el 2002 tomaron esa construcción y la mejoraron un poco para ver que esto daba lugar a un sistema de fusión abstracto, como los de antes, y en particular pues a un grupo 2 local finito. Y bueno, también hay otras maneras, que ya no voy a hablar, con teoría de representaciones modulares, también aparecen otro tipo de, de grupos dos locales finitos. Pero bueno, para, para concluir, pues lo que les quiero contar es que sí ocurre lo mismo, cosas muy parecidas a lo que ocurría antes. Entonces, fíjense aquí, condiciones sobre el espacio clasificante en el otro lado me aparecen condiciones que tienen que ver con la categoría y que son condiciones más de tipo algebraico. Entonces sigue habiendo esta misma diferencia entre la parte homotópica y la parte algebraica. Entonces, bueno, aquí se ven varias relaciones que lo hicieron Broto, Levi y Oliver, que fueron los que inicialmente introdujeron este concepto de grupo pelocal finito. Y bueno, solo por darles algo que yo también aparezco, algunas de las propiedades parecidas en las que yo he trabajado, algunas de ellas, por ejemplo, con, con Noé, también de acá de México, en el que, por ejemplo, podemos expresar la K-teoría del espacio clasificante en términos de representaciones de este sistema de fusión o otros, otros ejemplos, ¿no? parecidos a los de antes. Si se fijan, muchos de ellos son generalizaciones de los de antes, por ejemplo, este de penilpotencia, es una generalización natural de la penilpotencia de grupos. Y bueno, solo para concretar, para terminar, es muy interesante esto de las locales. Una de las conjeturas abiertas en topología, y que es una conjetura muy bonita desde mi punto de vista, tiene que ver con esta propiedad pelocal de tener un peso grupo normal no trivial. Entonces, Quillen propuso esto en 1978, que G tiene un peso grupo normal no trivial si, sí, solo si, sí, la realización geométrica del conjunto ordenado de P subgrupos no triviales de G es contracta. El álgebra y el espacio topológico. Okay, voy a parar aquí. Una situación cómoda de las dos charlas.